What's up brand builders, Stephen Hurrahan here on the Brand Master Podcast and in this episode I'm speaking with an author who has written six books, including one of my favorites, The Coaching Habit, which has sold over a million copies. I am of course talking about Mr. Michael Bungay Stanier. Now in our chat today with Michael, we dive into seven of the most important questions to ask clients, why the advice monster doesn't give you the authority that you think and what to do instead, and how to create perfect conditions to convert your prospects. So if you're working directly with clients and you wanna learn questioning techniques to improve your conversions, relationships, and project outcomes, then don't miss this episode of the Brand Master Podcast. Welcome to the Brand Master Podcast, show specialized in helping branding professionals and entrepreneurs to build brands using strategy, psychology, and creative thinking. Hello everyone and welcome to the Brand Master Podcast and I am absolutely delighted to have the one and only Michael Bungay Stanier on with us today. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time out to, to join us. When I say I'm, I'm delighted to have you on, you know, that's not lip service. Like I, I've, <laughs> I've been following your stuff, uh, I, you know, your books are awesome. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Stephen, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And it's nice that I, I didn't, we didn't quite realize when we set this up many moons ago that we'd actually be in the same time zone. So we're both early morning Australia. <laughs> so yes. To and people that's... listening and watching, if we're a bit bleary, it's because of that. I yeah, haven't had and... enough coffee yet. For... That, that's it. That's it. That's it. And as, a, as I was just saying to Michael off camera, I've just shuffled the kids out the door. So it's, uh, it's game time now. We're straight into it. But yeah. We're, we're on the same time zone, so, uh, so yeah. we're good to go. But, um, but look, for, for anybody who uh, doesn't know who Michael Bungay Stanier is, he is the author of six amazing books. And one that I, I have to say has had a massive impact on me, and that is The Coaching Habit, um, and then also The Advice Trap as well. And we're going to get stuck into uh, a lot about what those books cover uh, in this chat today. But um uh, Michael, just a just a, a quick kind of overview. Um, you know, n- not to kind of jump into you know your 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 uh, you know your history from birth or anything like that. But one one area that I do have a lot of curiosity about is you know because what you talk about uh, you know is is the power of questions and mm. how we get stuck in our head of of you know, getting caught in this advice trap when really questions are so, so powerful. When and how did you figure out the power of questions? Well, um, I, it happened, I think when I was a teenager, it happened kind of on two parallel tracks. The first is, you know, I'm like 17 or 18 or something in, in Canberra and going out with my friends, going out dancing and drinking. It's funny because my, my niece Harper is just that age here in Canberra. So she's like, I'm going out and I'm drinking a can of Smirnoff double black, and just <laughs> two shots of cheap vodka and some sweet syrup. And I'm like, oh, I did that as well in my day. And then at the end of the day, I'd find myself um, often sitting with one of my friends, um, basically talking about angst love lives. I didn't really have a love life to be angsty about, mm. but my friends did. And I, I remember sitting there just going, look, I'm, I'm good at listening, but I don't know what I'm doing here. Mm. And um, I'm not sure if this is helping or hindering or whether I could, whether we're, we're stuck. <laughs> it's probably all of, all of the above. But um, I, uh, when I went to university, so uh, 19 or so, I joined what is called Lifeline here. Um, which is a crisis telephone counseling service. Wow. So I kind of, that was my first experience of learning mm. how to kind of ask a question, knowing that the, the first answer is not their only answer, and to kind of use questions to deepen the conversation and get somewhere more interesting. Um, so that, that's where that seed got planted. Um, at the same time, because I was, I was a gangly, awkward teenager, I mean, you all probably feel that, but I definitely was. And my mom was like, look, the way you become more interesting is you, you ask people <laughs> questions because when they talk about themselves, they think you're fascinatingly interesting. So it's also designed to be a, a way of me picking up women, which honestly didn't work. <laughs> didn't pick up women for years. But, so yeah, it, um, you know, and that training in crisis counseling, um, which I did through my, my time in Australia 
at uni here and then when i went to england to study i did it there a bit as well um when i started working in london i started noticing the rise of coaching in in the west coast of the us so you know when you live in london you're like those hippies <laughs> those weird hippies <laughs> in the west coast but i was intrigued enough that when the company i was working with at the time took me over to um took me over to boston to to live and work i basically started thinking of myself or talking about myself as a coach and basically it just started getting into a place where asking questions was part of the work that i did mm. my first job was in the world of innovation and creativity and i ran focus groups so that's actually asking questions and then i became a consultant and good consultants ask a lot of questions so this has been a lot of practice about the power mm. of staying curiosity um kind of built into my my life and my my brain wiring and my attempt to pick up women in my career path <laughs> Uh, and I love that. I really do. And one thing that I've kind of, and, and I know that your book um, had a, a big impact on me when I read it back then, because I was kind of figuring some of this stuff out, um, you know, mm. with, with my own clients. And then I was reflecting on, you know, personal lives and stuff like that. And, and thinking to myself about the people in my life who I valued or the people in my life who I found intriguing or the people that I, I liked spending time with, they tended to be curious about me, about my life and what right. I was doing versus uh, other people who you spend time with. And they're not so curious about you. They want to tell you about, you know, their <laughs> yeah. accomplishments and, and that That's gets so, so boring. It, it really gets boring. And, you know, when you have somebody who's totally engaged and, and you can tell that their questions are coming from a real place of genuine curiosity. You know, you, you feel this sense of connection that they actually want to know who you are. So I, you know, uh, I love that your, your uh, understanding and, and figuring that out came from, you know, those humble beginnings and, and just dealing with people yeah. on, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's uh, very true. I have the same, it's one of my kind of more basic tests when I'm starting a, a new relationship with someone like I can talk to somebody for an hour and mm. effectively have them talk about themselves for an hour because I'm genuinely curious and I'm good at asking questions. Mm. I love it when people disrupt that and make me talk about myself. I'm mm. like, oh, you're interesting and you're good mm. at this. This is good. This is, we're off to a better. I, I like you more now because yeah. you're genuinely curious about who I am as well. And it's so basic. It really is. And you know, so much can can come out of that. I don't want to go off on a tangent here because I've got so many things that I want to cover in this <laughs> show, but just ba just on a, a, a basic human level and, and where I come from, from this point of view is talking about branding and, and branding is all about connecting a business with a person and just yep. business in general, connecting with another person, you know, the power right. of just that basic question just that basic curiosity and if they if they really feel that that curiosity is genuine you're not just trying to sell them something then you know that connection can set you off on uh you know right. on a great path now in your book well, the coaching well, i'll just uh, let me just jump in on the branding piece because i spent yeah. some time in my life doing stuff around branding as well and you know you can talk about brands as a promise kept that's one of the ways that you can frame what a brand is which is around a consistency of action action and and delivering on the promises that you make. Mm. But you can also think of a brand as you know, brands that work for you or what brands that complete you in some way. You know that, what is that, that Tom Cruise movie, You Complete Me? Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie. Um, but it, there's a way that I, I'm interested in a brand because it gives me something, it completes me in a way that is something that's missing in my life. So a brand mm. has to ask the question about what, who are you? Yeah. And what, what do you hunger for? And what yeah. do you need that you may not even realize you need? If I can answer that need, I become a brand that's important to you. Yeah. And, and, and just building on that, it's about inviting people into your tribe. And if you ask the right questions to show that you really get this person and you really get yeah. who they are and those, those challenges that they have, and you, you get down to the, the, you know, those, those subtle intricacies of, of those pain points and those challenges, just by asking those questions, then they go, ha, yeah. th this person gets what, what I'm all about. And, and, yeah. you know, that's when they start to buy into your tribe. Um, just on, on your, uh, the, the coaching habit. Now, this is, this is the book that's, that's influenced me uh, the, the most. And, 
you you use seven fundamental questions which are broken yep. down into just just quickly the kickstart question the all question the focus question yeah. the foundation question the lazy question the strategic question and the learning question now we don't have My time attempt to do branding <laughs> yeah <laughs> guys, like trying to they're trying to trying to 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 thingify something so they've got, uh, they're more than the questions themselves. I, and and I love that. And and you know if you're able to to wrap an idea up into a vehicle that that we're able to understand, you yeah. know that gives us meaning. And then we're able to compartmentalize that. And 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 yeah. I love that. So so the, your way of thinking just aligns with, with with how I think as well. We don't have time to jump into all of these because you like to talk and I like to talk and we would be here all day. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. But I'd like to jump into a couple. If you could kind of give us the premise of of uh, a couple of these questions, I want to look at the yeah. focus question, the strategic question, and the learning question. If you've got a bit of nice. time to do that, starting on the yeah. focus question, give us the premise of that. Yeah. So the focus question is, what's the real challenge here for you? Mm -hmm. And the premise is, the first challenge that shows up is never the real challenge, and it's mm -hmm. rarely the only challenge. Yep. It's and we are wired to want to leap into advice giving and solution providing and answer whipping out and all of this sort of stuff. So that when somebody comes and goes, ah, hey, Stephen, here's the thing I'm wrestling with. You're like, oh, you know what? I know how to help fix that. And I want to help you. So you kind of get tempted to go into it. But actually, you know, if you build a reputation in your work or in your life as the person who always figures out the real problem, you just become immensely valuable to those around you. Because mm -hmm. in most organizations, big and small, people are working really hard on the stuff that doesn't really matter because mm -hmm. it's the stuff that presented itself first. So this ability just to stay curious a little bit longer, and rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly, which is the kind of the definition I use around coaching stay curious a little bit longer, mm. you know, you stay curious about what the real challenge is. And it means that when you really figure out what the real challenge is, the answers are going to be actually really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I love that. And I speak about the five whys as well. And that's just the idea of continuing to dig until you get to, to where the real challenge is, because we often layer yeah complexity over the real challenge to kind of protect ourselves, I guess, really from yeah. what our, our insecurities are, because when we reveal what our insecurities are, then you're getting to the core. So we tend to, yeah. to layer that and protect ourselves. So you really have to peel back the onion to, to get to the center point. So I, I love that. And for, for anybody dealing with clients, I find this is really helpful in a prospecting uh, stage yeah. where you're, you're helping them to get to, to the challenge. And if you can, help them to verbalize their challenge, then, you know, you, you've you really tapped into something where they go, ha, 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 this guy is, or, or this girl is getting to, to what the real challenge is. Well, this, and also they often don't know what their own real challenge is. Mm. So you, you add value in the conversation immediately by going, look, I want to be, a, I don't want to just be a transaction for you where I give you, you buy a solution from me. I want to help you actually solve the problems that matter most to you. So let mm -hmm. me help you figure that out. Yeah. But let me pick up Stephen on the five whys that you talked about, because yes. that's a very known kind of consultive tool, which is like, why? Yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? Yeah, but yeah. why? It, it's come from a and, Japanese, a Japanese, I can't remember his name. Um, I believe it's come from, from a Japanese author. Or, I, I first read about it in, uh, through Peter Senge's work. Okay. Um, I don't use that because right. I find why as a question is tricky mm. because for two reasons. Um, first of all, when you ask somebody why, mm. it's actually quite hard to ask that in a way that sounds generally curious and without an agenda. Yeah. So often when you ask why, it sounds like what's wrong with you mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. or what's your problem or why haven't you figured this out? It, it often comes quite loaded. So, yeah it's a rare occasion that you can say why, and it doesn't feel a, a little tense. Whereas what's the real challenge here has a more neutral, less triggering way of asking it. Yeah. I, 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 I totally, um, I'm totally with you on that. And I actually talk about the five whys, but then I reposition the five whys and I say, oh, nice. if you ask five whys, 
you're going to get a strange look. So here's five <laughs> different ways that you can ask why. Well, and, nice. and it, it's yeah, like, you know, tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. And that's, yeah, you yeah. know, it, it's kind of positioning the why in a different way, but mm. you're still drilling down. It's like using a different drill bit every time. So that you're not that's getting true. hit with the same, with the same uh, objections every time. Yeah. Okay. I don't um, understand drill bits because I'm immensely impractical, but I'll, I'll go with that metaphor. <laughs> now, I want to I wanna, uh, fly over the foundation question and the lazy question, and, and this is simply because we don't have time. If you haven't read the book, go back and read the book. I really, really recommend it. And jump on to the strategic question. So tell us about the premise of this. Well, the strategic question says we're always at our best. We're making choices. And strategy is, in fact, having the courage to make bold choices. Mm. So the strategic question says, if I'm going to say yes to this, what must I say no to? Mm -hmm. You can flip that around. If I'm going to say no to this, what must I say yes to? Yeah. Um, but, but most commonly, it's if I'm going to say yes to this, what, what are the opportunity costs? And what are the things that I have to set up barriers to? And how do I actually commit to this? Because a yes without an understanding of what the no's are and that, that that's the implication of a yes is that it must come with no's. Mm. just means that if you don't do that, you're just piling more yeses on, and that doesn't work because everybody's at full capacity. Mm. Uh, so let me ask you, Stephen, why, why that question? Why do you particularly find that useful or powerful? The strategic question? Yeah. I find it super powerful when it comes to positioning mm. because when we position our brands, it's not about who we're saying yeah. yes to. It's about who we're saying no to. Mm. If you can't first get clear exactly. on who you're not serving, then you are not going to have an idea of who you are serving. And it's a super, super difficult when you're in the role of a brand strategist to find a unique position. And I find yeah. that the best place to start is to start by ruling people out and going, we're oh, not yeah. for them. We're not for them. We're not for them. We're not for them. And all of a sudden, the big market that you had gets broken down into segments of people who you're not serving. And it just focuses in and brings, uh, you know, bring illuminates the people who you are for. So uh, I love the whole, you have to, to understand the no's before you understand the yeses. And that yeah. I find the no's are sometimes an easier place to start. I love that. I mean, you know, you've got a good brand when the reaction is a strong yes or a strong no. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. What you don't want is indifference. When Man, a whole bunch of people yeah. going, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> but when yeah. you have people looking at you going, you are definitely not the person I'm looking for. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, um, I, I founded a, a training company called Box of Crayons. Yes. And um, it really, it really got strong reactions. You know, some people are like, I love the name of your company. I think I've heard of it. Mm. I'm like, we're pretty small. <laughs> you probably haven't heard of it, but I love that. You know, as somebody who cares about brands, I love that response. Yeah. But I also love the fact that I hear occasionally people going, look, we are never hiring a company called box of crayons. That, that <laughs> that's not appropriate for us. And I'm like, perfect. You are not the people I'm looking for. And, and that's, uh, and that's, it's, it's so true because, uh, and, and we get, a lot of us get crippled in believing that if one person out there has a negative opinion of us, it means that everybody has a negative opinion of us. But if you don't mm. have people out there who have a negative opinion of, of you, it means you probably don't have people out there who have a really positive opinion of you. It's, as you okay. said, you're in the middle, you're in the meh uh, you know, uh, track, and, and that's not where you want to be. If you're polarizing, if you take a position, and, and this whole yeah. no versus yes thing, I think we can apply this to so many more things. If you're if you, if you're taking a position in the market and and you want to attract the right people, then it's just about calling out the things that you are not for and the things that you don't like and the things that you don't agree with, uh, as as much as the things you do agree with. Because it's it's yeah. when you call out those things that you don't agree with, the people who you are aligned with, they're more likely to be attracted to you because of your no's than your yeses. That's right. that's that's right. what I find. Um, the learning question. Tell us about the learning question. Yeah. So if you, if you lead people, you know, whether you have a big team or a small team, really one of your key jobs is to try and make your people smarter because mm. if they get smarter, they become more competent and more confident, and more self-sufficient and more autonomous. And that is not only good for them, it's good for you and it's good for your organization. Mm-hmm. So it's really helpful 
if you can help people learn. But it turns out it's really hard to help people learn. <laughs> and one of the annoying things is that advice rarely sticks. You know, advice typically goes in one ear and out the other ear. Yeah. So when you sit down and go, listen, Stephen, here are my pearls of wisdom and nuggets of gold. This is not going to remember most of that most of the time. Yeah. Don't, people don't even really learn when they're doing it. I mean, they mm. do a little bit, but not so much. The power, the most powerful learning moment is when you actively create a moment for the learning. Mm. So that's what this final question, this is number seven of the seven, is about. And the question is, what was most useful or most valuable here for you? Mm. What was most useful or most valuable here for you? Yeah. And you can basically ask that question at the end of any exchange. Mm. I mean, like Stephen can ask this at the end of every podcast. He goes, okay, we've just been talking to this guest. If you had to name what was most useful or most valuable here for you from this conversation, What's the one thing you really want to take away from this podcast conversation? Mm. And you can see how that just turns up the heat a little bit from mm. going, oh, that was interesting. Michael burbled on, Stephen burbled on. It was perfectly pleasant to listen to, mm. to actually saying, name it and, and wire it. Get those brain synapses firing mm. so that you've got a better chance of remembering it. So you can do that with the people that you lead. You, know, you have a team meeting and you go, great, let's just go around and check in what was most useful or valuable for you from this team meeting. You can do it in a sales conversation. You have a sales conversation and you go, hey, before I go, let me check what was most useful about this conversation for you. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what was most useful about it for me. And three things happen that can be powerful. One is that other person names and extracts the value that they might otherwise have missed. Mm -hmm. Because contrary to what we all hope, not everybody notices <laughs> the wisdom and the amazingness of you on the other side of the table. So you're actually mm. forcing them to name it and see it. And they may, they may have stepped over it otherwise. Mm. Secondly, you get feedback as to what's working. Because sometimes you're in a conversation, you're like, that was hope. I was hopeless. Mm. <laughs> that was hopeless. I was hopeless. Nothing, nothing good happened here. But if you go, but let me just check. What was most useful and most valuable, if anything, in this call? You'll actually find value that you might you might otherwise have missed. Hmm. And then thirdly, and this is the more kind of nuanced, slightly sneaky thing. You are constantly priming your conversations as useful, valuable conversations. Hmm. So when you sit down with a prospect, for instance, and you go, I love talking to you about your business. Um, I love sharing a little bit about what I do. What was most useful or valuable for you from this conversation? They, the last thing they will remember is I've just named this as a useful, valuable conversation. Mm -hmm. And that just you know, tips you a little closer to getting the end result that you want. Yeah. I, I, and I really love that because it's so useful in, in many different areas of business. And it, it helps us to, it really helps to solidify the learning first and foremost, because sometimes yeah. You know, as you said, uh, you know, we can we can just sit here and listen to a podcast or listen to a module and, and go, yeah, that was interesting. But it's not really until you ask the person what, uh, you know, what was it that they they learned? Does that, you know, the solidifying of of that learning actually happen? And I find this this happens as well when you when you start to to listen to information from the point of view of, well, how am I going to teach this? You know, if mm. you, if you listen to, to that information, you take another perspective. If, if you're thinking, well, you know, I, I'm going to have to, to, to teach this later on it, because it helps you compartmentalize that in a place where it's more easily accessible later on. So it, right. it, it gets stored to memory. And, and yes. that's, that's uh, rather than the, the information just flying over your head, you just grab it and you, you, you pop it in there. So, um, so yeah, one, one of, of <laughs> you're, you're reminding me of that scene from guardians of the galaxy. Do you know that movie? No, 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 no. You don't know the movie guardians of the galaxy. I know the movie. I haven't seen it. And, I, and I, like I'm, a, I'm a big movie buff as well. So it's, it's, uh, I'll, I'll have to it, look, Michael, when you, since, since, the, 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 the kids, kids right? came on the scene yeah. seven years ago, yeah, movies exactly. were taking a backseat. Anyway. There's a scene for those those people listening who have seen the movie. You'll probably remember the scene where the the, the wrestler guy Drax, I think his name is, went in response to 
don't somebody saying don't use metaphors i'll only go over his head he goes <laughs> it wouldn't go over my head because my reflexes are so fast i would catch it anyway funny I'll, I'll, have movie, to, I'll have to get really unfunny if you haven't seen the movie so apologies <laughs> you can cut you can cut this out and post <laughs> now the advice monster is is something that i absolutely love I, I, mm. I love it because it's what you said before, when you're able to wrap a meaning around it, it, you know, it makes sense. Why do you think that we have this need to give advice and what impact do you think that has on the person that we're quote unquote enlightening? Yeah. So having written the coaching habit and it gone on to be this kind of big success, you know, it's sold more than a million copies now around the world, which is pretty extraordinary not least because it was a self-published book. You know, it got turned down by the publisher. So it got self-published. So I feel not only successful, but smug about it. Mm. And what I noticed is I, when I talked to people about the book or they emailed me or whatever, I'd, I'd have kind of people from three different camps. I have some people like you, Stephen, who are like, this book is amazing. I got it and I understood it and I use it. And the questions are fantastic. And it's changed the way I show up in the world. And I'm like, mm. you're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> And, uh, and I just, all I get to do is bask in the glow of that. It's wonderful. And then I have some people who go, I hate your book. I hate coaching. I hate curiosity. You're a dick. <laughs> I, bleh. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is the people who are saying no to me, just like our brand conversation earlier on. You know, one of my favorite reviews from the coaching habit is somebody wrote, this is the worst book ever written. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I doubt that, you know, I could be, but I doubt that felt like a slightly harsh reaction, quite frankly. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of people in the middle and that, that their typical reaction was, I, li I like this in theory, but in practice, I'm finding it is quite hard to actually implement, quite mm. hard to change my behavior and stay curious a little bit longer. What, what's up with that? And that's where the advice trap book got written from that place, which is a deeper dive into, you know, it sounds easy to stay curious a little bit longer, but it turns out that it's harder than you realize. Mm. So I think there's two levels to this answer. The first answer is just to acknowledge that we have all been very well rewarded and encouraged and prompted and trained by life and society to, to think that answers are the thing. Answers are the currency. You know, you go through school, you know, you've got three young kids. When they go to school and the teacher goes, who knows the answer to this question? You've got a whole bunch of them with their hand up in the air going, I do, I do, I do. Mm. It's like, this is how you are successful. You show, you prove that you've got the answer. Yeah. And, you know, we get tested and measured and tested and measured through various school levels. And then when we start our career, it's like, you know, learn your stuff. <laughs> Become a subject matter expert. Yeah. So it takes, it's, it's a very deep habit. It's deeply wired in our brain to go, this is the way I add value. And you can see that when you get into a working life in particular, where or just a life where it's all a bit more complex and you realize you have <laughs> very few of the answers, the kind of anxiety of some of that is, is palpable. Yeah. But there's a deeper level. And this is where the advice monsters come in, which is like, I think there are kind of three main, let's call them ego states yeah. that protect us, you know, keep us safe. Um, and, uh, and they're the key reason why we, we love to jump in and give, give advice. And the three advice monsters are tell it, save it and control it. So tell it is be the person with the answer. If you don't have the answer, you're letting everybody down. So make sure you're the smartest person and, mm -hmm you have status and authority by knowing the answer to the problem. Mm -hmm. Save it says you've got to protect everybody. You've got to rescue everybody. You've got to make sure that nobody struggles or finds it's difficult. So protect your status by being the person who can save everybody. And the third advice monster is control it, who says, um, that, so the third advice monster is, sorry, a uh, third advice monster is control it, who says, look, um, don't, don't let go of the steering wheel, hold on tight to everything because um, you don't want to let the randomness of other people and chaos in the future coming in and muck things up, control everything from start through the middle to the finish. Mm. And you have status by being the person with your hand on the steering wheel. Mm. And of course there is a place where the time where 
you want to be the person who gives the answer and you want to be the person who helps other people and you want to be the person who's in control of the moment. But when it becomes your default response, and that's what it is for most of us, that's when the advice monster has taken control. And that's when we default to advice giving because we're like, this answers my need to tell it or to save it or to control it. Mm. And so just as you're saying, the, these advice monsters are images or metaphors or just ways of trying to uh, make real these more nuanced ego states that keep triggering a pattern of behavior that isn't the pattern that you want. Mm. Yeah, and, and I, I really think that having a persona around the advice monster, because that's what it is, you, you give the advice monster a persona, it makes it easier to identify when it's happening and right. to, to extract it as well, because, you know, you're not criticizing yourself. You're going, ah, there's that advice monster again, popping up all the time. And that's when you can, uh, you can see the impact of that. And, you know, really uh, uh, how that puts you on the spot and has you talking all the time instead of, of your prospect or the person that you're coaching. So uh, I, I really love, I've really adopted the advice monster into to my own uh, processes because when I was able to assign a, por- a persona to it, I, yeah. I was able to see it a lot easier and I was able to go, ha, right. that's that happening again. You know, the, um, I think it's, uh, if you go to theadvicetrap.com, mm-hmm. um, which is the website for the yep. this book, there's actually a free quiz that you can take so that if anybody listening is like, well, I really, I can guess, and you probably can guess right, right. But if you want a little more depth than a, you know, a, a questionnaire and a cheat sheet around some tactics, um, go to theadvicetrap.com. You should be able to find your way towards the quiz somewhere. Yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes to that to make sure that you can find your way to that. Now, talk to us about the power of helping your clients come to their own conclusions. And we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier versus giving them advice directly. So when we were talking about the learning question earlier, we were talking about reflecting on, on what you've learned to solidify that learning. But I've also found when, when and, and this is through you know, the, the, adopting the, the philosophy of asking questions, yeah. when you help your clients come to their own uh, epiphany or their own idea about what they need to do, it's so much more powerful than you just telling them what to do. Do you? Do you why is that, do you think? In your experience, what makes that more powerful? Well, when we figure things out ourselves, we, we trust our own experience. So we learn growing up by making mistakes. And when we figure out what's causing those mistakes, we, we, f- we feel a sense of achievement. Like we, we need to give ourselves a pack, pat on the back. And I think, this I, think. Is, is, I think this goes back millions of years in our DNA, you know, uh, you know, our DNA kind of rewarding us, giving this hit of dopamine that, you know, we've overcome a problem and that has created these new n- neural pathways to say, ah, here's the answer. Here's a new neural pathway. You can find that easily again. Whereas when we have so much information and advice coming to us, it's so hard to create neural pathways because it's it's right. in the learning and in the figuring out does your does your brain actually physically change by creating those neural pathways? That's that's what I believe in in kind of morphing yeah. some of the stuff that I've read about about psychology yeah. and stuff yeah. like that together. What what is that? What you believe as well? Yeah. Well, all I what I'm hoping people who are listening and noticing is how I made you come to your own conclusion and to answer <laughs> that question. So we're Beautiful. doing, a, doing a, 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 this is what it looks like when somebody, yeah. when somebody does that and you can see that I, I could have, ans- I could have given that answer. Um, but Stephen gets much more excited when he's talking about it himself and it kind of nails it. And I give him the authority to claim that answer. Mm. So I've, I've increased his sense of status and control in this conversation, which means he actually likes me more and trusts me more. I do like so him by, more, Michael. By, <laughs> you like me more. I didn't say you like me a lot. You just, you just, I've, I've got off of the bottom here. And but here's the other thing that's that's neat about getting other people to come to the conclusion. And you go, so what are you thinking? I've got some answers, but what do you think? Mm. Is they tell you what they know, mm. and it also leaves the door open for you to go. Well, they've said what they've said. I don't need to have said that because it would have been redundant. They'd have just been going, okay, he only knows what I know. Yeah, but you can come in at the end and you can say something extra to kind of prove that you actually do have authority and wisdom. 
So this is how I prove that I'm the smartest person in this podcast, where I go, that's great, Steve, and I like all, everything that you said. Here's what's also true. There's, there's, a, there's a good research that says as soon as you offer advice, it creates resistance. It's, mm-hmm. called, it's, the, it's the homeostatic nature of a system. Mm-hmm. Systems and human beings are systems. <laughs> they design to maintain the status quo. And, and when you push into a system, the system pushes back. It's why change is so hard in organizations because the system just goes, you kind of like things as they are right now. And when you come in and go, I've got this brand new idea, I'm going to mix things up. So all sorts of ways that the system responds and reacts to that. Mm. So part of what I'm doing is, um, uh, you know, when I get you to um, tell me what you already know, you then feel better, you feel smarter, you feel like you have status. And you're more willing now to hear what I've got to say because you're like, mm. actually, I've told you what I know and you haven't diminished me with your authority. Mm. So what, what extra can you tell me? And I can tell you that little bit about the systems and homeostasis and the like. Yeah. So not only have I r- raised your status, and made you feel smarter and in control, I've also suddenly reminded you that I'm the smartest person here. So Beautiful. Both- I, I, I love that. I really, really love that. And I know. I, I'm not 100% sure I'll watch the, the podcast back later on, but I'd imagine when I was given my answer, I was probably looking up to the right because when I'm, when I'm, when I'm thinking and I'm using that part of my brain, I go into a different state and uh, yeah. I'm tapping into a different place in my brain. So I'd be curious. I'll, I'll watch this back and see if I'm looking up to the right as I'm, as I'm giving That's interesting. the answer. See, I'm, looking at my, I'm looking at my camera here. But you're actually down here, so you're in the you're in the corner of my eyes. This is going on, so I, I wasn't noticing the well, nuance of your, your I'll eye look movement. At, so I'll look it back and I'll I'll consult with you and I'll I'll let you know the findings. All right, that sounds good. Now, w- one of the the most powerful places that I find when it comes to asking questions, and I, I I probably think that it's it's most important in this phase, is in the prospecting phase because. When you're in the, the, the place of, you know, consulting or, you know, providing your, your strategy or, or your advice or your services, chances are you've already earned trust for some reason or another. And they've given you their trust and, and you're in their hands now. And, and of course, all of these questions are applicable, you know, within brand strategy workshops or any kind of consulting. But I find within the prospecting phase, they're probably even more powerful in influencing the, the next step or what happens next, because within that phase, you know, you're dealing with somebody who has next to no trust within you and, right. and you need to transition them from place of not trusting you to trusting you. What do you find are some of your favorite questions within that phase, particularly in getting somebody to go from a place of, I don't trust you. You're just trying to sell me something to, huh, you get me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a truism, although hard to act on, that the problem with most salespeople is they just start selling too soon. <laughs> You're like, I don't know what your problem is, but I have the answer, and it happens to be the thing that I'm selling you. Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> ah. I, I, oh. I, did the, I did that in the, when, I, when I transitioned to selling brand strategy services versus yeah. design services. I was telling all my prospects when they were coming to me, no, 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 you don't need a, a visual identity. You don't need a logo. You need a brand strategy. And as you can imagine, that didn't go very well. Right. So, so knowing that, how did you adjust your approach so that you got more business? Well, that's when I started to, I think that was around about the time I came across you and I, I started to completely change my, uh, my approach. And that's when I started to figure out, well, the, the more curious I am, the more receptive they become. Now, it didn't, yeah. it didn't make me, you know, uh, to, to turn these, these calls into conversions overnight. It was a process of, of realizing that, when I when I'm asking when I'm in the state of asking questions when I'm in this state of curiosity and the more genuine I am when I do it, the more they kind of open up. And when they open See, up, that's the secret. Yeah, we we get them to a place where now they're in a state where they're ready to listen to you. Before they're like this, but with those questions and and the more you do it, the more experience you get, and you know the different types of people, the different types of questions you can ask. But those yeah. questions, they they just 
they help them to open up. And it's only when they've opened up can you actually have a proper conversation. Well, here's, here's my experience. I, I think I've probably two things to say about this. The first is, well, maybe three things. The first is genuine curiosity is, a, is, a, is an attractive trait, mm. which is like, I'm really, I'm really up for finding this stuff out. And it shouldn't be the stuff that you can find out on their website. It should be stuff around, you know, what's hard for you at the moment? Mm. What are you up against? What's the, what's the, what are you struggling with? What's the gap that you're feeling between where you are now and where you want to be? Um, and that sense of, because people don't actually get asked those questions very often. And it's just, a, it's often quite powerful mm. to do that. And if you're showing up with genuine curiosity, you're creating a, a psychological safety to that conversation. Yeah. Uh, the flip side of that is we've all gone through a sales process where people are asking closed questions and you're like, I'm being manipulated through a sales mm. process here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, I drives me nuts when somebody goes, would it be helpful for you if I could triple your sales in the next six <laughs> months? I'm like, Oh, uh. I, I, I feel, I feel a, abused i feel dirty <laughs> for having been in that conversation with you because it's so transparently manipulative yeah that it, it drives me drives and we're me nuts. we're smart like mark some marketers and some salespeople they think people are stupid and we're not we're not stupid yeah, it's we, like we it's like genuinely insulting yeah you think that, 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 that i'm gonna this is gonna help that. me close the deal oh this guy is really curious what a nice guy here's the Here's the insight that's been really helpful for me as I think about that, which is, um, it comes from a, a marketing writer, thinker called Don Miller, who wrote a book yes. called Story Brand, which mm -hmm. I like. And he said this as a casual aside one day, which is like, people buy medicine. Mm -hmm. So until you can articulate what the, what the problem is, people, and until they know what the problem is, people won't be able to actually buy the medicine that you might have for sale. Mm -hmm. So I'm always going, how do I help them understand what they're up against so that they can buy the medicine that they need and that I happen to be selling. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mostly it's about that kind of open curiosity to say, what's hard for you? If we could, what, what, what does success look like for you? I mean, mm -hmm. What are you striving for? What are you ambitious for here? Mm -hmm. Um, and what's getting in the way of that <laughs> and, uh, you know, helping them see where they are and what their struggle is and what, what's difficult for them is helpful for them and helpful for you as well. Cause then you go, look, some of the stuff I can't help you with, but when you talk about this, uh, we've got a way of share, we've got a way of approaching that that might be helpful for you. So would it be helpful if I could just talk to you a little bit about one of the ways of approaching this and, you know, you can see me me hedging a lot in my language. Mm. And I'm doing that because I don't want to risk either of us losing face in this conversation. Because I've, I've worked hard to create psychological safety and raise both of our statuses as we've had that conversation. Mm. And if I'm now going, so now I want to tell you about why my stuff is amazing. If they go, if, if it's not a genuine yes, like the, I want to hear that, um, it, it feels like you're forcing choice on them. And that means that they're not at choice, which means it's no longer an adult to adult relationship. Mm. Whereas I go, would it be helpful if, would it be useful? Could I, could I put this on the table and share it with you? If they're like, uh, you know what, honestly, I just don't have time for that. You're like, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's no problem. Mm. Um, and you can both walk away from it without the relationship being damaged because, um, you've given a way to make everything a, a moment of choice. Mm. And, and something that I've actually learned just through this conversation is something that you've done with me a couple of times. And I think uh, for, um, for our listeners, it's, it's very, very useful because sometimes you get on the phone with somebody who just wants to hammer you with questions. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's, that's perfectly normal. You know, they, they, they want to know if you've got the minerals to be able to, to help them. But what I've noticed, yeah, what you've done with me a couple of times is you kind of judoed it on me. You've taken one of my <laughs> exactly. questions and you've, yeah. you've at the end of your, your, your answer, you've, you've flipped it back on me. And, you know, that's, that's yep. a, a, a great 
tactic to be able to, you know, to to take somebody who is on the offensive, who is hammering you with questions to just yeah. judo, judo it on them and, and, and put it back to them. And that, again, can help to take somebody who's in a defensive state to, to open them up a bit more. So uh, I've yeah, really noticed you, that you've give done a, that. Let me give you the script I use. And okay. you can adjust this, of course, but I, I basically have a script, which is, that's a great question. I've got an answer for you, which I want to share with you. But before I give you my answer, I'm curious to know what you already know about this or what you already think, or what are your first thoughts about this? Yeah. Yeah. Because what you're saying to them is like, I promise you I'm going to give you an answer. Yeah. I'm not going to walk away with this without having had that conversation. Yeah. But just before I do, just out of curiosity, well, you know, what are you already thinking about yeah. this? And, and, and that, that kind of frames it as, you know, I'm not deflecting here. I, I do have an answer for you and we'll come back to that. But it, it, it kind of, it, it 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 puts you back in a position of authority um, because yeah. you're they're gone from putting you on the spot to you going well before I give you my answer let's see yeah. where you're up to uh, you know so that we we know right. where we're at and it kind of it kind of opens that out and that kind of segues into my my last question that I have for you here is around that I, idea of authority how important is authority when leading and how or, or why exactly does simply asking questions help to achieve that authority? Why do you think that asking questions helps you to achieve that? And why do you think that authority is so important? Well, here's the way I think about it, Stephen. I'm trying in a conversation to keep the other person engaged. And I know this is neuroscience. I know that five times a second, their brain is asking at an unconscious level, is it safe here or is mm -hmm. it dangerous? Mm -hmm. Safe or dangerous, safe or dangerous. Yeah. And the brain, because the brain's rule number one is to survive, it's going to err on the side of this might be dangerous. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, it's hypersensitive for anything that makes it feel like danger. And when it, when it feels safe, it kind of leans in. Yeah. When it feels dangerous, it looks to opt out. And, you know, this is just deeply wired into our brain. So I'm like, how do I increase the sense of safety and reward in this conversation? And I use a, a four-letter acronym, TERRA, T-E-R-A. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, how do I increase a sense of tribiness? Meaning I want their brain to go, you're with me rather than against me. Yeah. How do I increase the sense of expectation, meaning I want their brain to go, I think I know what's about to happen rather than I, I can't guess what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. I want to increase the sense of rank, meaning I want their brain to go, I'm as important as this person, if not more important. Mm -hmm. And I want to increase, increase the sense of autonomy. I want their brain to go, I have choices here. I'm not being forced to do anything. Yeah. And the more I can do that, the more that they're going to feel that this is a place of safety and reward for them. Hmm. And asking questions just is a very powerful way of increasing the terror quotient. Hmm. What that means is it often is a way of, it often has the impact of diminishing your own sense of status and authority a little bit. Because the authoritative place to go is to say, I have all the answers. Let me tell you, hmm. you shut up. I'll just lecture you for a bit because I'm the smart person here. Mm. I, I know the answers. I have the high authority. But that diminishes tribe, it diminishes rank, and it diminishes autonomy. It mm -hmm. increases expectation, but overall, it diminishes the terror quotient. Mm -hmm. When you ask a question, you say, this is a great conversation. I'm, I'm curious, how do you feel about this? You raise um, ter uh, the tribiness, you raise their rank, you raise their autonomy, and so you, you can argue either way about whether it raises expectation or not. Mm. So I'm less interested in my, my own authority. I'm more interested in going, how do I make this conversation feel safe? Mm. The one thing to say about your own authority and your own status is to understand how much you have to give and play with. And I think it's just true that if you're a, like I am, a straight, tall, white, English-speaking, overeducated, very handsome dude, <laughs> You, you have a whole lot of authority, so you've got more that you can give away, um, mm. more that you can play with. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you don't hold all of those cards, you just have to think differently about how much can you give away 
And how much do you need to maintain and hold on to so that you maintain you stay kind of a, a credible com- conversationalist? Mm. Yeah, I really like that because it's a it's another perspective um, on the 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 dynamic and really as really as you've put it, the 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 most important thing to you is not your authority uh, but the environment that you create for them, and if you're able to That's create right. that that terror environment as as you've said it you know it it puts them again it just it puts them in a place of 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 being able to open up so you can have a genuine conversation so it's 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 um it's a great philosophy and it's it's something that i i might look at kind of diving into a little bit more to 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 understand the 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 ways that i can kind of create that environment that you've been talking about but it's it michael it's been an absolute pleasure it's been a joy of a conversation first thing on a on a monday morning to, to kick off off the week um i've no doubt that the listeners are going to get a ton of value out of this and those who haven't read your books are going to be running to uh to find where they can get them and on that note what is the best place for everybody to get yeah. in touch with you to find your stuff to find your books and find what you're you're up to yeah you know honestly the best place to go is to the website hub so that is mbs.works Mm-hmm. Um, and you can get access to the books. I've got a new book out called How to Begin, which is how do you set a worthy goal, something that's thrilling, important, and daunting. Mm-hmm. All of the books have kind of free resources, so you can access that. There's a great free course on the site called The Year of Living Brilliantly, which is literally a year of 52 different teachers coming to you to kind of provoke and challenge and inspire you. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of free good resources there. So mbs.works is the place to go. Beautiful. And and everything that we talked about in this will be in the show notes. So you'll be able to uh, to grab that there at brandmasteracademy.com on, on the blog. You'll be able to catch it on YouTube. You'll be able to catch it on the podcast. But no doubt, if you're, if you're at the, this stage of listening to the podcast, you have picked up some absolute gems. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My pleasure. And I hope to chat to, to you again in the future. That sounds lovely. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Michael. We really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to learn more brand strategy techniques to level up your skills, make sure you check out brandmasteracademy.com. There's plenty of free resources and premium content for you to download and get you going. If you'd like to join our Facebook group full of like-minded brand strategists, all learning from each other, then find us by searching for the Brand Strategy Community, where you can find exclusive content for members as well. If you enjoyed this content, please be sure to give us an honest review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listened, and make sure you tune in for the next episode of the Brand Master Podcast.